You are listening to the EdTech Takeout from Grantwood AEA, an educational service agency that supports school districts in eastern Iowa with a focus on equity, excellence, and efficiency in education for all children. Hello and welcome to the EdTech Takeout, the podcast that serves up bite-sized technology tips for teachers. My name is Jonathan Wiley and this is Mindy Carney. Hello. We welcome are back. back. We are back. Schools are back, so we should be back, Mindy. That is true, I guess. Had to come in out of the sun and start work again. I feel like this could be an interesting episode because we have not podcasted for a few months now, and I think we could be a little bit ring rusty. I think so, too. Took us a little while even to get started today, so yeah. It yep. did take you a little while to get started, yeah, but we're we're here oh. now. So it's Did you all... say it took it took me a little while to get started? So we are back for more episodes, <laughs> Mindy, and I don't know, maybe we should talk about where we're gonna go with this show and some forthcoming episodes or maybe some changes and things we're we're doing. What do you think? Yeah, well I think we kinda talked about it um at the our last episode that we recorded, episode eleven. Talked a little bit about how we are gonna do the change up our introduction so that we have to write an introduction for the other person and they have to read it. Starting the next Starting episode. Starting next time. Right. Yeah, because Something we are so organized to. this time. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, the next episode will be introduced by Mindy in a style of my choosing. So that should be fun. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see how fun this is. Yeah, and we decided that after some discussion and our um, deliberations that we would... Uh, take a little break from the top five at least for a while and we're going to think about maybe some educational hot topics and things that maybe we have seen going around the web or maybe some interesting blog posts and articles worth reading and I'm going to talk and share about some of those too. Yeah because you and I kind of enjoy discussing different things and go back and forth about things and I think this will be a good way to kind of carry that over into the podcast so It'll be fun. Something different to do. Yeah, we're going to keep going with uh, maybe try and bring in some some guests here and there. Do you know who I would really like to have on the podcast, Mindy? Um, Ryan Gosling. Uh, close. Jason okay. Marshall. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I would definitely put those two in the same category. You were right. Yeah. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> so what do you want to bring in uh, Jason for? What do you want to talk to him about? I think Jason's the kind of guy that has all kinds of really interesting and fun stories about um, life and general <laughs> trivia. Yes. So I don't think we would ever be stuck for something to talk about. No, we'll just make it the Jason Marshall show for that day and just like sit back and enjoy the show, bring in the popcorn and be like, what are you going to tell us today, Jason? Yeah, I think Jason would definitely appreciate that. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. He could have his own reality show. Yeah, maybe we should just like call out random people that we want to have yeah. on the podcast and then... It will happen because of the magic of podcasting. Yeah, that sounds good. So we got Jason and Ryan Gosling so far. Right. If, well, uh, I'll, I have Ryan's personal cell phone number, so I'll just go ahead and text him quick. Sure. sure. We're yeah. all on. Uh, we can we can wait and see if that happens or not. I guess. Okay. Don't hold your breath. Uh, definitely not. No. Uh, so anything else? Looking forward to the future of this uh, amazing podcast we do? No, I think um, those are our big changes probably that you would notice between episode 11 and episode 12. And um, maybe we'll make some changes as we go. Who knows? So let's uh, jump into one of those changes we alluded to earlier. And that was uh, in relation to the replacement of our top five we're going to jump in here with a, a topic that you know when i when mindy pitched this to me she said is this kind of controversial and i i know exactly what what you meant when you said that mindy but um i don't know if it's necessarily controversial but i think those people have a lot of opinions about this for sure so um it's something that's been going around social media a lot recently and it seems it was your idea mindy i'll let you yeah. uh, pitch it or introduce it All right, so um, big topic right now on social media would be no homework for elementary students. And even, I believe they're even saying middle school students as well. And uh, whether 
teachers and parents agree with no homework or whether they feel like students should have homework every night. And I think you and I both have similar opinions about this. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, I mean, I saw an article, I mean, I've seen a few of these go around. Um, It was on Mashable.com about a teacher who wrote uh, a letter to parents and it said, uh, we can link to this, it says, Dear parents, after much research this summer, I'm trying something new. Homework will only consist of work that your student did not finish during the school day. There will be no formally assigned homework this year. Research has been unable to prove that the homework that homework improves student performance. Rather, I ask you spend your evenings doing things that are proven to correlate with student success. Eat dinner as a family, read together, play outside, and get your kid to bed early. So I think that's a really nice sentiment. And, you know, as parents, Mindy, you probably, like me, have um, struggled with homework. Yeah. Well, I think even as a teacher, I was um, kind of thinking back to my teaching career and how homework kind of evolved for me. And our school policy was that students had to have homework every night. They were supposed to have 10 minutes per grade level of homework every night. And uh, I feel like my homework evolved because even though that policy was in place, I tried to make it so that it worked for me because I didn't necessarily agree with students having to have 10 minutes of homework every night. I I feel like some of the reasons those policies are in place might be to help students teach responsive or learn responsibility. But the truth of the matter was, is when I have a student who's a kindergartner or a first grader or a second grader, the only responsibility is on me to make sure that my student has it done. And I'm not sure that it's necessarily teaching kids at that age responsibility because Are they really developmentally ready for that sort of responsibility to get all the way home, be like, oh, I need to get my homework out? Um, And so as a teacher, I think one of the things that I tried to change was that we did talking points every night. So um, I would send an email to the parents and give them like one or two things that we worked on in the classroom and questions they could ask their students. And then it became more of just a reflection of what they learned during the day and hopefully not so much about doing I don't know, correcting sentences or, you know, the stuff that you had to come up with. Just feel like we really need to be asking the question, like, why why are we giving homework and is it authentic for kids? Yeah, and I think, you know, even just putting some kind of twist on it like what you did is is better than maybe some of the more traditional formats that we see homework in. And, you know, what you were getting at there is, you know, it addresses like one of the problems I think uh, kids have like you know when they go home from school and the parents say hey what did you do today and they say I don't know nothing <laughs> we had right. recess and they just don't remember but having those prompts and things help bring them back around to the learning they were doing and it gives parents a way to interact with their kids and talk about something authentic together and you know relate their own experiences to the learning that they they did in school so yeah I mean we will uh, link to a lot of this uh, research that is that is going around the internet right now there's a lot of it going around from people like John Hattie and different authors that have done a lot of research into how effective homework really is Mm -hmm. and um, you know I think just to summarize what I've read on it and what I've seen of it it's you know there doesn't seem to be any noticeable effect on student achievement in elementary schools when they are given homework or whether they're not given homework and in fact sometimes it's the opposite they do better when they don't have homework and middle school is getting into more kind of 50 50 territory but right, high school right. there there is improvements in in student achievement so um lots of different people have written blog posts on that if you have any that you would like to share with us we are we would love to read it and happy to to share it out on uh, on either side of this argument for sure because um lots of great things to say about uh, this debate and to be fair Mindy I mean maybe we should just look at the you know the other side of the coin I mean the research is the research and whether you go along with that or not I mean I mean homework is one of those things that's kind of been like an institution it's we've done it for a long time now and it doesn't I don't know people would maybe think it doesn't appear to have done any harm but I don't know is there any uh, redeemable qualities to homework in your opinion you know The only thing I would say is that, you know, if students have skills that they still need to be practicing, um, I, you know, 
I'm going to bring up my sister. Her and I kind of got in this argument and she said, well, you know, when I send, send like sight word flashcards home with my students, they automatically improve. Well, that might be the case, but they might also have a parent that sits there and works with them. You know, are, are we not just widening the gap between the haves and the have nots? Yeah. And, um, I, I, to me, I just know that as a human being, when I was teaching, I was coming home and doing, you know, another four hours of work every night. And I thought that was, you know, I mean, I got to the point where I was really burnt out. And if we're really working our students hard and they come home tired at the end of the day, don't they deserve a little time away and maybe learning about something that they have a lot of interest in or um, kicking around the soccer ball in the backyard? I just think that um, we've really pushed our kids so hard and thinking that academic achievement, you know, is linked to how hard we work them and, and making sure that they're practicing more at night, more at night. And I, you know, the research just doesn't say that that's working. So why wouldn't we then want to free up our kids, our families? And I mean, I have a hard time finding 20 minutes to read with my student every night, you know, and he's a first grader and I know how important it is. I just think that um, if we're putting homework on top of that, then I'm losing some of that time with my kid and my family. Yeah. So. yeah. And I think one of the things I read that made me think about, you know, when I was a teacher in terms of what homework was being assigned was that, you know, this teacher said when she really thought about it, the homework she was giving was things that she didn't have time to cover in class. And so we're just giving them things because we think we need to cover more and more content right. all the time. And sometimes less is more. And right. if we could think about ways we could more efficiently cover the content we want to teach to get more of it done during class time, then then that would be a great option too and could lead to less homework. Right. Yeah, it's tough. Teaching is hard. I, I mean, teaching is hard. It's a hard job. Nobody knows unless you're you're in those shoes. And, and I get, you know, feeling the stress of having to complete so much or wanting your students to do so well. But, you know, sometimes you've got to give a little up. Got to Got to choose, choose your battles. Choose your battles. Sounds yes. good. Uh, we were gone all summer, but that doesn't mean we weren't learning still and that technology world wasn't continuing to evolve. So we are just sticking with what's new for the summer. We need a better title than that. We, yeah, could have done with a better title. The than Summer that. Steam. That was maybe like a working title that we never yeah. actually uh, polished up much. It's new over the summer. The summer sizzle. Ooh, right. I, well, right. Mindy, I think we should start with the number one story from our summer so far. All right. Which was Isti? No. It's the CISO the... ambassador. Oh, yes. We are talking to a CISO ambassador, people. <sighs> we are. I feel like there should be some music or something. Royalty music. I, yes, became a Seesaw Ambassador this summer, um, which I am obviously very excited about. Uh, I've talked to, I don't know, lots of teachers and lots of schools about Seesaw. Everybody is so excited about it and um, just happy to wear that Seesaw t-shirt around with pride and get to talk a little bit about some of the new updates with uh, Seesaw Plus. And um, I don't know, are we going to talk, do you want to talk about this right now, like Seesaw Plus, or do you want to wait, or... Well, what does it mean to be a, a seesaw ambassador as opposed to a self-proclaimed seesaw ambassador? So, um, seesaw ambassador, I just had to go through a training, and then um, being a seesaw ambassador, I get um, to talk to lots of teachers about seesaw, um, and I think I have to do like a certain amount of presentations each year about Seesaw, but I don't really pay attention to that because I, I, and I have to like record them and stuff, but I wasn't really worried about that number. So I don't know how many it is. Um, and then I get to share Seesaw Plus with uh, teachers for an extra month for free. So if you have a Seesaw account, you get an extra, you get two months of Seesaw Plus for free, and then I can give you an extra month um, with my ambassadorship. Hmm. So you could put a link to that in the show notes for people that I might could, be interested. I could, because actually, to be just put it out there, if I get 30 scans of my personal QR code for Seesaw Plus, I get a Seesaw hoodie. So if we could all 
just kind of band together here, I would really like a Seesaw hoodie. Yeah, this podcast is not brought to you by Seesaw. But... No, it's not. But I am self-promotional. Um, so the other thing I get to do is um, hand out Seesaw t-shirts so I can order those for free and hand those out. And yeah, I get into the Google Plus Seesaw Ambassador group. So it sounds like a great community with lots really of good is. connections to, uh, you know, learn about the best ways to use this tool. Yeah, absolutely. Lots of lots of communication with the other ambassadors. That's that's um, a very very active Google Plus group, I would say. So it's good stuff going on there. So it's everything you hoped it would be, and more. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm um, I'm happy to be part of the program. It's it's a it's a great product. You know, I can't talk about it enough. So, very well deserved, Mindy. I cannot think of a better person to be an ambassador than your good self. Yeah, I know. I can't either. <laughs> 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 All right. Well, let's follow up uh, very closely behind the announcement <laughs> of Mindy as a CISO ambassador was the fact that uh, Mindy and I, as well as the rest of the digital learning team at Grandwood A yeah, here, went to ISTE in denver colorado this summer yes yeah it was my first time yeah it was your first time so what what were your impressions of of isti because you've been to you know technology conferences before but um isti's kind of different isn't it yeah it's huge it's huge i the amount of participants is is shocking even um the amount of people that are around and just um the broad scape of different topics and things like that. Uh, it's neat for me too to see like all of those big name people that you see on Twitter and follow on Twitter and um, like walk around and well, I didn't know them by face, but you're like, oh, there's Tony Vincent. I'm like, oh, let's, we should go say hi. Or, yeah. oh, and you met with Dr. Wesley Fryer. Were you going to bring that up? I did have the chance to have a, a, a meeting with Mr. Fryer and his wife. They were very hospitable, and we, we sat and chatted one morning, so that was good to see him in, in person. Yeah, so it's just neat to um, see those people that you really admire and, and see him just out, like, walking, like, among the mere mortals. That was kind of neat. Yeah. It's kind of surreal, I think, the first time, like, you went to the keynotes, right, in the, yeah. uh, in the big theaters, and yeah. you just look around, and there's, like, there was, like, fifteen or 20,000 people there or something. It was just yeah. a huge, huge sea of people. Yeah, and people that really just care about education and care about kids and are really passionate about in the integration of um, educational technology. And just to be with that many like-minded people in one place is pretty powerful. LeVar Burton was there at ISTE. Yeah, with R2-D2. And R2-D2 was there too. You could have got your picture taken with R2-D2 if you waited in a very long line. I know, and I didn't want to wait, but I still wanted my picture with R2-D2. That was pretty cool. Yeah, I told my kids at R2-D2 it was at ISTE, and they did not believe me, but uh, I had photos to, to prove it. So did you get your picture taken with R2-D2? No, I did not. No, I you just... just took it from a distance? Yes. So is there someone else standing next to R2-D2 in your picture? <laughs> there <laughs> well, was look, no, kids, actually, this, no. this lovely lady was standing next to R2-D2, but not your dad. Yeah, I was thinking maybe I could Photoshop her out of the <laughs> way, but uh, no, it didn't work that way. That seems wrong. Yeah, so ISTE was uh, fun. Do, I mean, do you want to talk about any of the sessions you went to or any of the things you were learning about there, Mindy? Um, you know, I really try to focus on Minecraft just because I don't, um, there's not a lot of stuff around here about Minecraft. And so um, I went to some of the Microsoft stuff and um, I went to actually a really great session of teachers that are actually integrating Minecraft into their classroom and um, just got some different ideas there. Um, one of the things that I, uh, thought was some of the cool ideas that I thought were things that students and teachers who maybe aren't familiar with or comfortable with Minecraft are things that they could even get started with. And it was just like creating a bar craft with Minecraft, a bar graph with Minecraft. A Sounds bar like graph a with twister. Minecraft. A bar graph with Minecraft. Okay. Because, you know, I mean, you just build with these blocks and Minecraft, well, you could make a bar graph with different colors to show um, something in math. I thought, oh, that's, you know, something to get somebody started. Yeah, um, for sure. I thought that was kind of neat. Uh, but they talked about even more complicated things like creating worlds for students before you get in there and then like um, laying dynamite in different spots like around the city and then um, 
creating like an earthquake and then students could talk about how some of their uh, landmarks fell and how some of them um, stayed strong through the earthquake and then comparing the two different building techniques and styles. I mean, just stuff that I hadn't really even thought about. I am still so wrapped up in how to make like, I don't know, a wall that to hear (laughs) them talk about it. I was like, I, my brain hasn't even gotten there yet. So, um, that was, it was really interesting to me and, uh, it was, you know, it's just something different that I hadn't really experienced before. So Minecraft EDU, this uh, new platform that Microsoft is now in control right. of, that that launched officially in the summer. Is this that summer, yeah. During yep. during its day, that kind of time there. Um, it was, I think, actually a little bit before, or like just maybe like the week before or something like that, and then um, that's why I think they launched it before, so people could kind of get in and have because it's not like just an app you download. You know, you have to like get the software and whatever. So I think. It was their way of kind of taking people through the tour of how to make it work. So, All right. Yeah. Sounds good. Yeah. We should set up Minecraft EDU here at Grant Wood and uh, have you do some demonstrations and, you know, maybe you could I know. be a Mike. Main- I put that on my calendar of something that I wanted to tackle next week and figure out how to get that all put together. Maybe you could be a, main- a Minecraft ambassador. Uh, oh, I'm not, I'm not going to be a Minecraft ambassador. I... I'm not even close to being there yet. Once again, right. still working on building a wall. <laughs> still working on that one. Yes. All right. So apart from Minecraft, um, anything else that stuck out? Um, I saw George Kuros. He made me cry three times. So that was good. That was really mean. Why did he do that? No, he was, he's just like, seems like a really nice guy. And uh, the stories he told were like really touching. And yeah. um, he did like this little not little, but a digital citizenship spiel, um, which I had seen some of it before. uh, But it was just, it was really good. It was really inspiring and um, talked about, I don't know, like teenagers with good social media and bad social media and about promoting yourself and things like that. So yeah, it was, he was, I hadn't ever heard him before. So that was, that was kind of me just being like starstruck, like, oh, so you didn't hear him when he came to Grantwood? I didn't, no. Huh, okay. Mm-mm, so no. Yeah, he's he's a really inspiring speaker, I think, and he's had a, he's got a lot of great stories to share from other teachers and and he concentrates a lot on the good things that are happening in school and the the changes that that we need to make in order to continue these these good things. Yeah. He was good. Um and what else? Oh, uh we had a poster session. While we were there, so um, Stacy, my courageous boss, and my teammate, Gina Rogers, uh, we presented a little bit about badging and how we're doing badging here at Grantwood AEA with our staff so that they can earn a badge for different skills that they've acquired. So we got to talk with people. And so this, these poster sessions, like, are it's kind of like a gallery walk wouldn't you say is that kind of how yeah it's different from the normal kind of sit and get sessions where you can just walk up and talk to anybody you want to and they will happily tell you what they've been working on and and why they are here to present at ISTE yeah so that I think was probably the coolest thing about ISTE was just going to those poster sessions and getting to connect with people and actually have a conversation with them not just having a speaker in front of you that's presenting, but actually have conversations and able to ask questions um, in a pretty informal setting. So I really like that aspect of SD too. Good. What about um, you? What about me? I I saw some interesting people as well. I mean, I had never seen Hal Davidson before. He with uh, the Discovery Education team. Right. He did something on uh, AR, VR, and QR, and I think that's – something that we're exploring as a team more and more. I think it's always good to go and get more ideas and resources from that one. Did you, did you see that one at all? Well, I saw it when he was in Iowa city. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. I'm guessing it was probably the same session. Yeah. I think he he does a great great job at keeping up to date on all the latest technologies on that because it does change so fast and lots of good things on there. And we'll maybe touch back on that uh, VR stuff in a few minutes here, but um I also went to I went to a BYOD session. Did you go to any of those, Mindy? Uh, I didn't, no. So those are like sessions you have to sign up for ahead of time, and they're specific a lot of the time to, to one device, which I'm not always a huge fan of, but I, 
I am a I am a fan of Bill Selleck, who is a, a teacher out in uh, California, I believe. Mm -hmm. And he did an iPhoneography session, which I thought was kind of cool. It was right mm. at the end of the day, like at four o'clock or something one day. Ooh, that's and brutal, though. That's what? That's brutal. Yeah, it, but session, it, poor guy. <laughs> The, the context was was the the content was really good, so yeah. it was it kept your interest for sure. Yeah, and that's good. Bill was They're really doing personable. Lots of commercials that way too, right? Haven't you seen these commercials where they for iPhone where they show like these little movies and then at the end it says shot on shot on an iPhone? Exactly. Yeah. Anyway, so Bill is uh, somebody I've admired for a long time, and his. Uh, teaching partner there was Nicole D'Alessio, I think. Uh -huh. uh, how, I don't know how to say her name, but they both talked about things that were really applicable to not just iPhones, but iPads. And so whether your kids are using their cell phones or whether they're using iPads or, you know, it could be any kind of mobile device, really. And it was about how to um, take good pictures, how to, how to use pictures, how to edit pictures, how to, you know, make them a part of the curriculum that you're doing for visual learning and design so so was it more about photography or more about using your actual iphone it was a bit of both yeah a bit of both mixed in with how you can make that fit in your classroom yeah right so they did a really nice job and i i may have slides from that um session i could put in the show notes yeah okay um what else did i do oh i speaking of people i just kind of went to see just because i like those people i went to see a guy called jason oller who wrote uh -huh. a book called uh digital storytelling i read as part of my master's degree and uh he's a really interesting guy i think he's on the ISTE board and really? he did, I did that name doesn't sound familiar to me at all i'll have to look him up on twitter yeah he talked about um future trends in education in regards to technology so huh. we had one of the keynote speakers at ISTE that did something like that, but I want to say Jason did a better job in terms of making it more contextual for educators and for school and for for things that are coming up in the future so um, so did he talk about the new ISTE standards or not? No, he did not. He talked about um just trends that in technology that are going to affect education whether we like it or not. So things yeah. like big data and storing your data in the cloud and mm -hmm. what what kind of implication mm -hmm. that has for student data is yeah. very interesting. Did he talk about um like the data hostage situation at all with schools or anything like that? Um I don't recall if he did or not, but yeah. just talking about how, you know, the data that we have and that we're putting up in the cloud is, you know, it's our, it's our data, but we are having to trust other people to look after our yes. data, to keep our data yes. safe. Yeah. And, you know, he says we kind of have the illusion of free will with uh -huh. that kind of thing, <laughs> but we're kind of being manipulated into the decisions we make because, you know, some of these companies will use data to, you know, serve ads and to steer you in different places in the internet and do all that kind of stuff. And it's just trying to be more conscious of, of things like that in the digital world we live in. So I talked about things like that. I talked about um, BYOD and just the immersive lifestyle that we're starting, where technology is becoming so much more part of our uh, life and how things like AR might be... Um, a very big movement too in the future. So yeah, lots of interesting things. Yeah. And last one I saw, I thought was kind of interesting, was um, just, it was about online learning. And it was uh, Dr. Carnahan, Dr. Hummel, and Dr. Arsuala, who were all experienced uh, practitioners of online learning. And I started to think that maybe some of the PD and things we do at Grant Wood um, would lend itself very well to an online environment and looking at tips and ideas for how we can do professional learning for teachers that they can access anytime at their own pace and on demand. And Yeah, is, this this, is that the online rubric that you sent me? Yeah, I think it was part yeah. of that. Yeah, for uh -huh. sure. I'll have to add that into the notes. Yeah, for sure. Okay. So ISTE was a good experience. And, yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, this was my thought third ISTE, so I feel very fortunate. Grant Wood is always very supportive at sending us to conferences that we can go and improve our own learning so that we can pass that on to the teachers we work with, so yeah. we're very appreciative of that. Oh, yeah, no kidding. Very lucky. Well, um, speaking of going places, we did just get our Google Expeditions. We did just get our Google Expeditions. Yeah. We got a classroom kit of Google Expeditions with 30 phones and 30 VR viewers and 
Uh, there's a router in there and a tablet and all kinds of wires and extra stuff. So yeah, that's comes fun. In, like this big, huge, like bulletproof case. <laughs> it is a it's huge, intense. heavy case. <laughs> yes. It's got like traveling stickers on it. It's very cool. Got yeah. Fun came from Best Buy Education. I think that's the only place you can order them right now, but yeah. uh, we've had some fun playing with them. Yeah, yeah, I checked it out uh, the other day, and actually I was more on the student side, although I did peek over and look at the instructor side of it, but um, it's it's kind of neat to think that you can put 30 kids on it. It's 30, right? Did you say 30? It's 30. Yeah, we have 30, yeah. Yeah, put 30 kids in the same spot and then be able to kind of immerse them into, uh, you know, the same place at the same time. Yeah, so if you're not familiar with uh, Google Expeditions, it's um, it's it's a kit that Google now produces where you can take over 200 virtual field trips. And um, in the kit that we bought, it came with 30 smartphones um, and 30 Viewmaster VR viewers. Is that what mm -hmm. they're called? Something yeah. like that. Yep, yep, yep. And so you as the teacher, you, you get a tablet and um, you're in control of the tour. And when you start the tour, it appears on all 30 headsets. And it's a 360 degree experience. The students can look up, down, left, right, anywhere around the scene that you are taking them to. Mm -hmm. And um, on these tours, there's a, like a little text part on the side where you can uh, have some talking points or tell the students some facts about the place where they are. And there's the ability to tap on certain features and an arrow will appear on the student's screen directing them to go and look at something so that you can all look at it together and then talk about it some more. Yeah. Um, and when I was going through it on the student side, the Gina was actually the one that was doing it with me. But so she was reading all the different information about, I think we did whales or whale sharks or sharks or something. Anyway, there were even some, um, I would say, higher level questions, too, that uh, she asked. So it wasn't just like reading facts, but it was also some extensions and thinking about why things would be this way or how can we conserve um, to save our sharks or, you know, I mean, so there were some higher level thinking questions that um, – I, I always thought that was the hardest part of teaching is what is a good question and when should I ask it? And it's kind of nice to have some of those built in there. I really liked that. Yeah, it's really good to have those those prompts on the side there because um, it helps make the students think more critically about you know mm -hmm. the location or the environment they're in. And they can yeah. be absolutely anywhere almost. I mean, there's some of them are like in space. Some of them are in tropical rainforests. Some of them are under the ocean. Some of them are in... I don't know. You can go to the Taj Mahal. You can yeah. go to Buckingham Palace. You can go to all kinds of different places. Yeah, right. And I think one of the things that we're we're looking forward to doing here at Grantwood is we want to bring some teachers in to experience this firsthand, some firsthand themselves, and then you know start thinking about how could we build in the curricular connections here. So where are where are the what's the curricular crosswalk that we can make with um, what it is you're teaching? Um, so there was a blog post that I think either you or Stacy just sent that was uh, like a, I don't know, English teacher of some sort. And he was trying to find a way to bring in this experience for his students and really wanted to make sure that it wasn't just the wow factor of bringing in, um, you know, VR or AR. Um, and so one of the things that he did was have his students – um, use expeditions for like imagery and writing imagery and how it's easier for, it's probably easier for people to, or students to write with imagery if they can actually see it themselves um, and having them then describe a place that they wouldn't normally get to go to or something like that. And really, I, I think we sometimes get it, we really toe the line about bringing in technology that is merely just to wow our students and be like, oh, this is really cool. But then finding ways to actually implement it with some, you know, integrity. Um, and so I thought that was kind of an interesting way to do it. And, you know, the kids are engaged with the wow factor, yes, but the wow factor eventually wears off. So you really have to be mindful of how you're integrating that kind of stuff. Yeah, and I completely agree with all that. It's It's one of those things that the technology is – kind of relatively recent and relatively new that we haven't always uh, 
had the time to explore exactly the best ways to integrate this into our curriculums and what we're teaching with kids but that should absolutely be at the uh, the forefront of what we're doing otherwise it's it's just more toys more gadgets and things like right. that so I do have a question about Google Expeditions that maybe you can answer. Um, how are all of those – because Google Expeditions comes with, like Jonathan said, 30 phones. How are those phones managed? Like how do you put – do you have to put apps just on individually? So if you were to put like Google Street Maps on them? Yeah, so this is something we have been talking to Best Buy about on the yeah. on the most efficient way to do this because you can't plug them all into a car and sync them off to a computer. Uh, you can't – um, I mean, there may be some mobile device managers that would work with them, but I think the way we're, we're intending on, on managing these is setting up one phone and having it, you know, as an image or a backup and uh -huh. just restoring that individually yeah. onto the other phones. So, Got it. I mean, the ones that we have here, they're, they're basically only going to be used for expeditions. We're not going to probably right. be checking the phones out for anything else. So we probably right. won't be updating them too much as long as we can keep the expeditions app update. And so my other question then is, um, what was I going to, oh, so can you just, does the teacher always have to run it or can the kids just turn the phone on, put it into the viewer and like play on their own or does it have to be run by the, the teacher? I don't know 100% for sure, but I know that when you, uh, I think there, there is a teacher version of the app and then there's yeah. a student version of the app. Yeah. So um, I, I think for the most part, it's pretty much teacher directed, but yeah. I'm not going to say definitely for sure the kids can't do anything without it. But um, I do know that Google have said that they are planning to bring that um, expeditions to iOS. So oh. even if you don't have the ability to get to experience one of these Google Expedition things, you may be able to use these with iPads. And hmm. so you're not going to be able to fit your iPad into a VR cardboard right. headset or anything, but you're going to get a lot of uh, the same functionality. The kids will be able to move the iPads up and down and all around the room to see different parts of an environment and um, being able to access that on technology you already have for free is, is going to be a great thing too. Hmm. Yeah, it's pretty neat. All right, so uh, maybe our final learning experience for the summer was a conference that we put on ourselves here at Grumble Day, yeah, and that was iPad U, where we had mm -hmm. we had Clay Riesler come and keynote. He is at Recess Duty on Twitter, and we also had featured speakers like the great Josh Allen, uh, Sarah Lauk, and Anna Upa who came and did some sessions for us too. So iPad yeah. U was, is something we've done now for three or four years. It's a conference focused on using iPads in education. But I think this is maybe one of my favorite ones because of the, the theme for the conference, which was show what you know. So it was really based uh, a lot around creativity and doing some really interesting multimedia things with iPads. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, and I, what I think is so neat, too, is that we have area teachers come in and, and share what they're doing, and um, and it's just a really great energy here, I think, because there is kind of a community that's being built amongst those, um, you know, iPad users, and I think even um, there are other things It's not necessary. I mean, it is iPad U, obviously, but there are other tips and tricks that are good for other de devices as well. But I think there's just a really strong community that's kind of been built around iPad U over the last couple of years. And it's just so fun to see those teachers who are um, showing the great things that their students are doing and what they're doing with their kids. So, yeah. And uh, so, you know, some Mindy and I were both presenting iPad U, but we were also learning as well. Um, I did a session on using green screen in the iPad and Mindy will not be surprised to hear I did an iPad podcasting session. Yeah, which I will say, I forgot to mention this, but you didn't invite me to like co-present with you. I thought that was interesting. You know, Mindy, it's when typical. I saw how many times your name was on the schedule, I thought I'm going to do her a favor and not oh, ask her whatever. to co-present here because uh, she's so busy and so awesome doing other things. Uh -huh. um, I, I, I looked at the Opinion Podcast app, Mindy, would you believe it? No, really. No. So we shocker. looked at iPad podcasting and we had people who were very enthusiastic about doing that and lots of great ideas now to use it. Okay. So were they were they mostly focused on students podcasting or doing something of their own like to share out to parents? 
you know, it was a bit of both. Was, I think yeah. most of the teachers that came were, were more focused on doing it with their students, which I think is really good. But, yeah. you know, with the, the theme we had, which is about creating and having students doing things with the device, that, that really fit in well with uh, what we were doing that day. Yeah. Um, yeah, I didn't go to any of your sessions. Sorry. No, but you were probably doing sessions of your own. So what were your sessions? Yeah, we, um, Gina and I tried to gamify iPad U. And I had kind of done something like this at our one-to-one conference last fall of spring, last spring. Um, but I, uh, Gina and I kind of teamed up and we took on the Ghostbusters theme and uh, cre- came up with different um, missions of sort, I guess, for our participants to engage in, mostly about their learning, reflecting on their learning, um, things of that nature. And then actually ran the whole thing through Seesaw um, and went through and then gave points for each mission and then used, uh, well, I didn't because we both feel the same way about sheets, but um, Gina wrote some formulas or something to come up with a leaderboard. Um, so that was super fun. I, I really enjoyed that a lot. Uh, so I saw lots of your Ghostbuster logos and yes. things like that around the yeah. around the agency, and I there was photographs of you and Gina dressed up in Ghostbuster costumes yes. as well. Yeah, yeah. Where I did, mean, when we're ghost, in, we're in. <laughs> where did the Ghostbusters theme come from? The Ghostbusters theme came from well, um, one of the things that we've learned about with gamification is that it's always good to have a storyline because people are more likely to engage in something that they can connect with. That makes and sense. And yeah, so the Ghostbusters movie was just coming out like a week after iPad U, the new Ghostbusters movie, and so um, another thing about gamification is that you should try and tie it into pop culture or um, something that's really classic, you know, like pirates or something like that. Uh, so we chose. Ghostbusters, and luckily had someone on the team, Amber, had uh, two Ghostbuster costumes. Uh, so yeah, it was super fun to wear that around for the day. Um, and then we also used Snapchat to toss out some um, Easter eggs to people. Snapchat isn't necessarily very popular with adults yet. And so we use Snapchat to hopefully um, get people interested in Snapchat and maybe check it out. So that was kind of fun, too, and something different that we just thought of on a whim, like at 9 o'clock in the morning. We're like, oh, let's make some Easter eggs on Snapchat and send people on little goose chases. So it was fun. That is an awesome segue there, Mindy, because you've been exploring uh, gamification in in different forms. And you have been doing a goose chase. Do you want yeah, to talk so, to that at yeah, all? Yeah, so Goose Chase is like this new, I don't know how new it is, but I've seen people starting to tweet about Goose Chase a little bit. Um, it's a service of sorts, I guess, that you purchase. And um, you can use Goose Chase for free. I believe you can only have, on the free account, you can only have five participants in your Goose Chase. But what you do is create missions inside Goose Chase that are either um, geolocation or text or photo and video and that's the kind of evidence that people have to submit to prove that they've accomplished their mission. Um, The geolocation is obviously the most fun because you can um, put in the coordinates of where you want people to go to and then um, they ping where they're at and then they receive points. So that's the other nice thing about Goose Chase is it takes care of that leaderboard Um, that can sometimes get a little bit complicated. Uh, So yeah, so we're checking that out hopefully for iTech. We're hopefully going to put together a goose chase for um, iTech in October. So more to come on that yet, I'm sure. Yeah, so just like all teachers, I guess, is the best way to say this. There's The learning doesn't stop over the summer, does it? No, it We've sure both doesn't. been very busy. We've had busy summers. I mean, we had some time off as well. We absolutely yes. did. But, I mean, I think all the things we've just talked about is one of the reasons we took a break from the podcast as well, just to give ourselves some time to recharge and learn some new things so that we had some things to bring back to you guys on the, on the EdTech Takeout. All right, so on to my favorite part of the show. It's the Tech Nuggets. And it's been so long since we did Tech Nuggets, Mindy. I have no idea whose turn it is to go first. Do you want to go first? I'll go. I'll go. You want me to go? 
Ladies first. I don't know if I necessarily call this a tech nugget, but I will say that um, I uh, checked out the Osmo coding and the Osmo Monster, which were two additional apps that were added. Um, I think coding came out this summer or maybe really late spring. So I know we haven't talked about that, but um, it's an extra um, box of manipulatives that you can purchase through Osmo that gets kids coding. Um, with hands-on um, things. So it's uh, I checked it out, and I don't remember how expensive that little portion of it was, if it was like 30 bucks or something. I think it's, it's engaging. I think students, kids would like to play with it. I think you can also get the same sort of thing without the manipulatives. I mean, the coding itself and getting kids coding and doing the drag and drop I mean, there are free options out there for you. I thought um, I thought it was good for little kids, though. I mean, I can see my preschooler kind of fit, sitting down and figuring it out. So, I mean, what do you think of it? You and you kind of sat by me while I w- was playing with it. What do you think of it? I mean, yeah, it was, it's very cute and engaging, and I like the kind of the mix that Osmo has on the you know the kinesthetic hands-on yeah. approach as well as mixing it with the digital. Yeah. So, I mean, that's still reasonably unique in terms of. Uh, how you interact with the system but yeah like i said i mean there there are other options too i mean there's nothing to say you can't use and mix and match all those options and just have some variety because you use the same thing with kids all the time and you know how that will go so i mean yeah the coding things is a nice extension for for teachers as well yeah it's Um, just nice to have the hands-on that's the great thing about osmo is the hands-on yeah, so maybe, I don't know, I'd be interested to see how you describe the Osmo Monster app because that's <laughs> quite different again, isn't it? Yeah, so the Monster app is um, not necessarily completely different from other stuff that Osmo has done because they have the Newton and the Masterpiece, which both kind of have some of the same sort of components where it mirrors what you're doing um, to the screen. So the Monster app, though, I would say is for pretty young kids. Um, There is a character that interacts with you. His name is Mo. He's a big, cute bear. Bear? Is he a bear? He's a monster. Yeah, he's a monster, I guess. He kind of looks like Sully from Monsters, Inc. He looks a lot like Sully, yes. Yeah. Um, And so he interacts with you and asks you to draw things, and then he takes um, the things that you draw draw and puts them on the screen and interacts with them kind of in like an interactive storybook kind of fashion. Um, it's, it's neat. Uh, I would say that you don't need to buy the kit though. I mean, I have to be completely honest. I don't think you need to buy the kit. It comes with a whiteboard. It comes with some really cool markers that are liquid chalk markers. I mean, that's pretty cool. comes with a, you know, something to clean the whiteboard off with, but you can do this free app. You can use it with a white piece of paper or your own whiteboard in your classroom. Um, but you still need the Osmo kit for... For doing this to stand you the have iPad to have the original and, Osmo, yes. Yep. I mean, you have to have the cradle and then the mirror, yes. But you don't have to buy the creative kit to actually use the Monster app. Yeah, it's fun to watch what they come out with. I think when the yeah. original Osmo kit came out, we're like, oh, I wonder what other things you could do with mm-hmm. an Osmo. How are they going to expand yeah. this out more? And so we're starting to see that now and starting yeah, to see be more of their roadmap. People, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah. All right. You're up. Well, speaking of creative people, um, this is kind of timely news as I as we talk about it today. I think it happened yesterday, but there's a indie app developer called Duck Duck Moose that some of you may have heard of. They make apps for um, I want to say like pre-K two kids for the most part. Definitely yeah. elementary. They're yeah. available for Android and for iPhones and iPads, and they had a set of, I think, 21 apps. They've recently been acquired or have a new partnership with Khan Academy. And as part of that, all of their apps are now free. So their apps used to be, I don't know, $1.99, $2.99, those kind of things. Now there's 21 kind of educational type apps for young learners now that are now free because they are part of the Khan Academy team. And I think that's just a, a really awesome thing. It's a good thing yeah. to, to share out with teachers. It's not one of these, they're free this week. It's yeah. They're free. Free so, forever. 
go take a look at those if you're working with um, early elementary kids or preschool kids. Um, there's lots of good educational apps on there. Yeah, yep. It's a good family of apps. Yes, it is. Um, I've got one more. Do we have time? Sure, let's do it. All right. Um, so I uh, played with Google Cast the other day with Chromebooks, and um, I really liked it. I liked it a lot, actually. So um, the way Google Cast works, you have to, and this was really hard for you, and I explained it, so I'm going to go very slow. Yeah, I did Google, have some issues yeah, with this, but you did. go on. I just don't think we were, we just, we, we just weren't connecting. But so as a teacher, my computer that I use to connect to my projector of some sort, smart board, Promethean board, just projector, whatever, that computer, you need to download the Google app Cast, okay? Now, your students can either have, and this is where I get a little bit foggy because you can have the Google Cast extension, but in your little three-dot menu in Chrome, you also have the option to cast. But right, so I don't think you need, yeah. you don't need the extension, do you? I don't, you don't need the extension, but it's nice to have it maybe up in your bookmarks. Yeah. Well, not your bookmarks, you but your extension Chrome street. Or Chrome OS, you should have that cast right. option in your settings. But I feel like you have to have the updated version of Chrome or that cast option does not exist. For sure. Yes. Um, and so through the, app on the teacher computer, then you invite students, but it's super nice because you can invite students through your Google Classroom email list. So once you have students signed into your Google Classroom, then you can just invite them by class so you don't have to type in a bunch of email addresses. So what does Google Cast do? Give us so, in a, in a sentence. Yeah. So what the students do then is they um, request to cast to your computer and then you allow them to do so. Their screen shares with yours so that you can see what they're doing. And then because you're attached to the projector, then projects up so that other students can see it. So it's like screen sharing with the whole class so that so, they can see it. So similar to things like AirPlay on iOS devices and things like that. All right. Yeah, cool. it's nice. Yeah. I like it. And I liked it even better after you explained it to me properly and we sat down and had a... No, no, no. I explained it to you properly together. the first time. You just didn't understand what I was saying. Yeah, you're right. Okay. Swiftly moving on. Um, I, I'll just do one more very quickly. We had a, another um, gadget arrive at Grantwood recently that we're kind of excited about. It's called the Mevo Camera, M-E-V-O. And it is a camera that simulates multi-device video recording so what it does and it's very clever is it it will take a wide angle video of the room it has facial recognition built into it and you know how on a, a normal tv show or a, a movie or something you'll see you know sometimes you'll see a close-up sometimes you'll see a wide shot sometimes you'll right. see a medium shot and things like yeah. that well you connect this camera to a phone or an ipad and what it does is it gives you kind of director powers where uh -huh. you can choose whether it's a close-up or whether it's a medium shot or whether it's a wide shot or whether you want to zoom in and zoom out and different things like that. So you take on the power of a director. Is it like through a dashboard or something? Are there just like buttons that you push on the iPad or how does that work? Yeah, because it automatically detects, um, you know, people's faces and things like that, it gives you kind of like a, a tic-tac-toe board of different shots. Oh, cool. And so like, you're like the director in the booth saying, give me camera one, give right. me camera two, oh, <laughs> back that's to camera so one. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. And you just tap back and forward on the different shots that you want to appear, and it records all that. Uh, like a multi-camera setup for video, which is really good. And yeah. on top of that, you can, if you want, you can live stream it to Facebook. So if there's Ooh. like school events and things yeah. like that that you want to have going on and maybe not everybody can get to them for whatever reason, you right. could live stream that from the camera and invite other people to view it on Facebook. Oh. So Does it make it. like suggestions of what kind of shot you should show next or anything? Or is it just like here are the shots that you could choose from, choose one? 
Yeah, it gives you two two options. One is here are the charts you can choose from. Choose mm -hmm. one. Or yeah. it's got this autopilot feature where it will yeah. just automatically switch between the shots. Yeah, yeah that's good. Yeah, I like you that. You would think it's good. It's not as oh. good as you might hope, but it doesn't always <laughs> pick the best shot at the best time. Sometimes you're somebody else is talking and, and so forth. But um, <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's fun and we're still playing with it and we're looking at ways of incorporating that into the work our schools do. So it's called yeah. the Mevo Camera and we'll put a link to that in show notes. We haven't played with that at all. That might be worth a shot sometime in the next couple weeks good one fun all right so i think that kind of brings us to the end mindy anything else you want to say on our our back to school episode no i'm just happy to be back it's fun it's good to talk to you again i haven't missed you but it's good to talk to you again well it's not like we haven't talked before but you know, i know, well, I know I, but mean. i still like i was gone a lot the last couple weeks yeah working. that's true we haven't really touched base much so yeah we kind of worked together this morning it was like old times just like old times. We're Just a bit like rusty, I think, but we're, 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 we're going to get back in there. We're going to be back with more we're shows right. and more episodes and more exciting things on how to use technology in your classroom. You betcha. So uh, if you enjoyed the show, we do very much appreciate it. If you subscribe in a podcast player of your choice, there's lots of them out there. We are on iTunes. We are on Google Play. Uh, we appreciate all feedback, uh, suggestions, or ideas you might have for future episodes. You can uh, reach out to us on Twitter. I am at Jonathan Wiley. Mindy is Team Kearney. You can email us, podcast at gwaea.org, or check out our website, dlgwaea.org. And until next time. This has been the EdTech Takeout. We hope it hit the spot. For more information on today's episode, please visit dlgwaea.org slash podcast. 